kelp forests of the underwater world. But above this marine jungle, there is today a giant oil operation of the Cordillera Mining Company. Derricks, pumps, and cranes take an untold fortune out of the land beneath the sea. Excess gases are piped to the surface and burned. Helicopters shuttle back and forth between the Cordillera operations. Men and machines together have transformed what was once a quiet shoreline into a vast industrial area. Whenever I pass here, I like to anchor my boat and watch this incredible sight. I'm kind of proud that I had something to do with it. Four years ago, none of this was here. Only the empty ocean and my boat riding this swell. I was fresh out of the Navy then, Mike Nelson ex-frogman. But the sea had already become part of my nature, and I made underwater research my business. I equipped my boat with a makeshift TV camera. It was experimental, but it worked. And on a clear day, my underwater camera could see 50 feet in any direction. Sending the picture up the cable to the TV receiver on the flying bridge where a turn of the switch showed me things I couldn't otherwise know. A big slow fellow was snooping under my keel. And there were other things I didn't know. A mile away, a hundred feet down, a group of geologists were exploring the ocean bottom for underwater oil. I didn't know then that one of them would never come up and that it would be my assignment to find out why. At 8.30 a.m., the heavy fog lifted. It was then that Lieutenant Dawson on the bridge of a Coast Guard cutter noticed a derelict boat. There was no sign of life on deck. Her name is Geronimo. There's still nobody at the wheel. Oh, she must have drifted a half a mile since we first sighted her. Her anchor's dragging. We better take a look at her. Let's pull alongside. Lieutenant Dawson boarded the boat. Is anybody down there? find anybody fore, aft, up, or below. As he looked around curiously, he noticed a deck full of strange equipment. Skin diving lungs, complicated instruments, seismographs that geologists use, different magnetic detecting devices, and a cabinet full of jars filled with sediments of different grain and color. Company. It's funny leaving all this expensive equipment unguarded. All right, let's tour in. My boat was anchored two miles the other side of Rocky Point. My assignment? Underwater research for marine land, the largest oceanarium on the west coast. My safety man was a woman, Dr. Kate Marlowe, an assistant curator at Marine Land. Equipped with an underwater camera and bait in every pocket, I was making a systematic study of marine life. The fish behaved a good deal like people. Some of them were shy, some of them curious and aggressive. Another, probably frightened of me, took the food and ran. The moray eel, one of the most vicious of all the undersea creatures, took bait right out of my hand. Others were chow hounds that I couldn't get rid of. Suddenly, Kate noticed a manta ray break the surface of the water. Mike! Mike! 
mine was anxious to have a specimen of this strange fish. So I tried to take it alive with a gaff at the end of a rope and chain. But 3,000 pounds of sheer muscle was too much. Neither I nor the rope could match the strength of the fish. When Kate got down, there was nothing left to show up at the end of the broken rope. Suddenly, I was aware of a sound vibration. It could be an approaching ship. Curious, I started toward the surface. I was puzzled by what I saw. A Coast Guard cutter had an unmanned boat in tow and was approaching as though to hail me. Hello, Mike. Hi, Lieutenant. Looks like you caught something pretty big there. You know anything about her? I found her abandoned the other side of the point. Mike, did you see this boat when you came out this morning? She's registered with the Cornelair Mining Company and loaded with oil research equipment. Oh, I never saw her before. We searched the area. Nobody near her. Just thought you might know something. We're taking her in. So long, Captain. See you again, Mike. What's the matter? That boat. Doesn't make sense. Why do you think that crew abandoned her? Hasn't been a storm in over a week. She looks ship shape. It was a mystery to me. Answer to this mystery was swimming into shore from deep water. He seemed to know every shoal, every rock, every grotto. is right. This is the biggest tidal oil field on any coast. No limit to what we can get for our information. I've already got a boat. I'll come into shore at midnight, take you and Barney off. We'll be in Mexico by morning. There's been a change. Barney didn't see it our way. Oh? What'd you do about it? The octopus. That means trouble. The Coast Guard will organize a search. They already have. I was two miles north of here and one of their boats came into sight. Well, I had to abandon the Geronimo in a hurry. She drifted this way, the Coast Guard followed and went aboard her. Then they'll be searching the whole area. I can't take a chance coming into shore to get you. Let tonight and tomorrow night go by. The next night, midnight, show a white and green light off a rocky cove. If I answer with a white light, wait for me. I'll swim out to you. If I don't answer, try again every following midnight. How about food? I'll live off the sea. A two-mile swim at night in choppy water won't be easy. Good thing you'll be using your snorkel. I don't have one. I had to abandon ship too fast. You think you can make it without a snorkel? Don't worry, I'll get one. There are plenty of skin divers on this part of the coast. Okay, night after tomorrow night. I'll be waiting two miles off Rocky Point. Check. It was late afternoon by the time we got back to Marine Land with a day's catch. I was especially excited about the new young porpoise Kate and I had caught that day. Like all porpoises out of water, he lay still, not moving a muscle, perhaps instinctively playing dead in self-protection. But as soon as he was in the tank, he came to life. In a moment, he was swimming with the other porpoises who had been trained to play basketball for the amusement of the marine land visitors. I could have spent the day watching the game. Any day but the day. Mike, there are two men from the Cordillera Mining Company waiting to see you in the lab. Cordillera Mining? Oh, yeah. That's that company that owns a derelict boat the Coast Guard picked up this morning. Where they want? I don't know, but they seem important. Well, let's find out. Right here is where we are. Would you show me where the Geronimo was supposed to be this morning, please, Mr. Ward? Well, yes, they were exploring a long, narrow area from here to here. 
You uh, say there were only two men aboard, huh? Two divers. Yes, I assigned only two. Usually I go along, but see, I'm head of the whole Tideland operation for Mr. Ward, and I had to go up the coast. Does the Geronimo carry short wave? She does. What's your diving procedure? One man stays on board while the other man dives. And in a case of emergency? Well, the man on board is supposed to radio the Coast Guard before he leaves the ship. What's the nature of the operation? Well, just a routine geological survey of the ocean floor. For underwater oil? Mm -hmm. Yes, they were to prepare a map, uh, sketching in the locations of old reefs and sandstone bars. And gas bubbles in the bottom. Did they carry dynamite or other explosives? Definitely not. Did you know these men well, Mr. Ward? Well, yes. Yes, they were good men. Barney had a wife and two children. Wilkes was a bachelor, but he was steady as they come. Well, he was the head of the local skin diver club. Three man lab. The Coast Guard told me that you were the best underwater man in the country. That you've gone deeper than anybody else in the world. We'll see what we can do, Mr. Ward. Thanks a lot, Mr. Nelson. It's for you, Mr. Ward, the Sheriff's Office. A diver with Cordillera Mining Company equipment was just washed ashore. They want you to identify him. Where are they? Shark Reef. The diver's legs bear the mark of an octopus. <laughs> Within 20 minutes of the call telling us of the discovery of a dead skin diver, we reached a lonely stretch of beach north of Shark Reef. It's one of our men, all right. It's Barney. There were two divers. This is the only one washed up, sir. Now, what's this about an octopus? It was an octopus, all right. You can see for yourself. It's the marks of the tentacles. That arm must have been a good four feet long. Well, that solves our mystery. Yeah, it sure looks like the marks of an octopus, all right. But an octopus never attacks. What do you mean? Yeah, I know, it's got a pretty bad reputation, but uh, at least in my experience, it's just not aggressive. You ever tangle with one? No, they've never bothered me. You see the marks, it couldn't be anything else. Here's another man who agrees with you. And I check with the Institute, same opinion. The octopus is not an aggressive creature. Uh, Mike, can I go along with you tomorrow? No. Why not? Not until I find out a little more about this particular octopus that we're up against. Isolated Crab Inlet used to be a favorite place for skin divers. The water was considered free of any danger. The holiday for these two began with a perfect day and a calm sea. They didn't know what the water hid from them. They didn't know they had something someone else wanted.
she found was the hose of his airlock. Bert! Bert, where are you? The next morning at 9 a.m., Bennett and I were on our way up the coast to the approximate location where the two Cordillera divers had been exploring for oil. Our men were diving right about here. Right here's where we are. We got another six miles to go. KOU to Argonaut, WA-1005. KOU to Argonaut. Argonaut, WA-1005, come in. We have a message for you from the sheriff's office. They request you contact deputy at Crab Inlet. A skin diver who was reported missing last night has been found on the beach there. Dead. With octopus marks on him. Thanks. I'll be passing the inlet. We'll go ashore and take a look. WA-1005 out. Uh, more octopus. He was dragged under yesterday. The current carried him in a half hour ago. Same as on your skin diver, Bennett. She was with him. Blue kelp. Cyanophyceae, the professors call it. Wonder what he was doing in a boy's t-shirt. Well, he went in for a swim. Kelp got stuck to him, and he came out and put on his shirt. But he didn't come out. He was drowned. He was washed ashore. Well, he could have come out and gone in again. Yeah, but he wouldn't have brought this piece of kelp out with him. Why not? Because this kind of kelp is found only at one place, Rocky Cove. I've seen that stuff everywhere around here. Red, brown, and green kelp, maybe, but not blue. And Rocky Cove is a good mile from here. Skin diver swims down. He doesn't go in for distances. Look, we're looking for one of my men, not kelp. What difference if it does only grow there? I really don't know. But first, we'll take a look at Rocky Cove on the way up there. Kelp, angelfish, and some eel grass, red snapper, bladder kelp. That blue kelp ought to be around here someplace. Too deep to show up on the screen. I'm going down. I gotta put my wetsuit on. It's pretty cold out there. Wait a minute. Why don't you come down and poke around with me? You brought your stuff along? Nelson, you're just wasting time. What if you do find the blue kelp down there? What does it prove? We're here. Let's look. Not knowing what to expect, I had my spear gun ready. But at 30 feet below, the blue water seemed to hold no threat. While I looked for the bed of blue kelp, the eyes of another followed every move I made. I tried not to lose my way in this ever-changing seascape where current and tide played an endless game of hide-and-seek by shifting underwater marks. The tangled jungle of kelp seemed friendly. The rising strands tinged the water with a soothing green. But time was wasting and I lit a flare to help my search. And then I saw it, the blue kelp. I knew I had my bearings and felt safely at home again. I dropped the flare to mark the spot and started up to get Bennett.
minute seemed to be at home in these waters. He swam down with powerful strokes, spear gun in hand, following me. While that other one, unknown to me, followed us. Soon we reached the area from which the blue kelp had come. What connection it had with the dead boy ashore, I didn't know. But somehow, there had to be a connection. There had to be a meaning. Suddenly, I was aware of a new sound in the water. Air bubbles, not mine, not Bennett's. But a third air lung somewhere near. I twisted around to look. Who was he? Then I saw the weapon in his hands. He was the octopus. I tried to warn Bennett, then spun to meet the stranger and was ready to fire. But suddenly, Bennett knocked the spear gun from my hands. And then I knew why Bennett had tried to keep me away. There was no way out, except what I'd learned from the sea. Obscure the water like a giant squid. The magnesium flare blinded him. When Bennett fired, he missed me, and the spear hit Wilkes. Now, with the odds even, I had a chance to handle Bennett. A sudden movement on the bottom made him turn. His guard was down. I went for his arrows. K.O.U. to Argonaut. Hello, Argonaut. This is Lieutenant Taylor. Come in, Mike. I need assistance, Lieutenant. Fifty yards off Rocky Cove. The Geronimo mystery is now solved. We're on our way. Bennett had been turned over to the sheriff. The law was satisfied, but I was not. I conducted a few experiments on myself with an octopus in the marine land tank. And two hours later, when Mr. Ward arrived in the sea plane, I was prepared to give him a first-hand report on how Wilkes had murdered his fellow geologist. Object? To keep for himself and Bennett a newly discovered oil basin worth a fortune. See? Marks from the fake thing are clear-cut, sharp around the edges. Mm-hmm. Marks from the octopus are irregular. You like to find out things for yourself, don't you? Only way to be sure, I guess. You know, Mike, I could use someone like you to replace Bennett. What do you say? Well, there's a great future in underwater oil. Pays well. Uh, thanks, but I'm afraid I'm not your man. I gotta be my own boss. Guess the ocean has spoiled me. Well, the ocean would still be your base of operations. But I want to be free, too. Free to, well, be able to say yes if someone should phone me and say, Mike, I've got hold of a map to a sunken ship that's supposed to be laden with gold, or uh, we've got evidence of a lost civilization off the coast of Africa, or uh, there's a derelict boat we just picked up off Rocky Cove. Understand? Yeah, I guess I do. Oh. Well, there'll be a check for you in the mail. Oh, but if you should change your mind, you can always reach me. KOU to Argonaut WA-1005. KOU to Argonaut. Argonaut WA-1005, come in. Is that you, Mike? This is Mike Nelson. This is Smitty. Are you free? I'm free. <laughs> so long, Mike. Bye, Mr. Ward. Can you come out to the Harbor Lighthouse? I'll be right there. I'm Lloyd Bridges. Skin diving is certainly a lot of fun, and it's full of adventure. See some more of it again next week, huh? When there'll be another excursion into that fabulous underwater world of sea hunting.